Hey there, Larry. How you doing? Great, Glenn. Great to be with you. Yes, this is Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv, brought to you from the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown. And I'm with Lawrence Kotlikoff, who's professor of economics at Boston University, my old friend. And we are talking, we're talking uh, economics, we're talking uh, public finance, um, and we're talking uh, climate change uh, policy analysis, and we're talking the Nobel Prize. Nobel Prize in the last cycle, not the most current one, went to William Nordhaus, uh, MIT alum. I remember uh, when I was a young student at MIT in the early 70s, he was, he was around a fair amount. He was at Yale, but he was around. Uh, William Nordhaus at Yale, who uh, uh, got the prize for his uh, uh, modeling and uh, economic evaluation of alternative policy uh, responses to the climate change problem. And Larry has a lot to say about that. He has a paper out, uh, you say it was published in the Milken Review? Uh, well, a summary. Uh, it's it's now been submitted to the JPE. We'll see whether it gets the journal public. Okay, he's got a big public. academic paper or study where he's got some colleagues. He'll tell you more about it, collaborating, uh, doing some quantitative analysis, some modeling and whatnot. Um, but you, you say that Bill Nordhaus, William Nordhaus, the recent Nobel laureate, uh, introduced a kind of religious and not scientific strain. And I wanted you to expand on that, Larry. Talk, talk a little bit about Bill, about the Nobel Prize and about uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly that you think he might have done in uh, impacting on the uh, uh, climate debate. Okay, well, let me, let me first of all just reference the paper. It's uh, it's joint with uh, Andre Polbin, who's an economist at the uh, Gaidar Institute in Moscow, and Felix Kubler, who's at the uh, University of Zurich, and uh, Simon Scheidecker, who's at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, and Jeff Sachs, who's down at Columbia. And it's called uh, Making Carbon Taxation a Generational Win-Win. And if you go to kotlikoff.net, you can uh, see, the, you know, download the paper. Uh, it hasn't been published yet. There's been a summary that's going to be coming out with a Milken review in, uh, in, a, in a month or two, in a couple months. Anyway, yeah, the concern of we ha- that um, we have is that uh, Bill Nordhaus, who rightly deserved getting the Nobel Prize for bringing the climate problem to the attention of the economics world and the policy world, uh, and I certainly uh, was one of many hundreds of people, I'm sure, who sent in nominations year after year to get him the Nobel, you know, to nominate him for the Nobel Prize, not that I was oh, you got to take credit for that now, huh? No, no, not that I was instrumental because I know they asked a lot of people to <laughs> nominate. And I just, I'm just trying to say, I think I'm not uh, denigrating in any way his huge contributions, major, but I do think that the way he posed the problem, which was uh, to uh, posit a social planner, this is a kind of uh, economic demigod, as somebody who has certain preferences about people in the future versus people in the present. He might favor people in the future a whole lot compared to those in the present. Man, may not even like people who are around now and, and put all his uh, discounting, uh, his preference weight, and that, that comes through a, a term called a, in, a, in mathematics called a discount factor. He might have a very low discount factor, so he puts a lot of weight onto the welfare of future generations. And then he cranks out a solution, Nordhaus does, to how to uh, fix this climate uh, problem whereby current generations are emitting too much carbon, getting that carbon gets in the atmosphere, it raises temperature, it produces damage. That's all his framework. And that hurts future generations, their economy. And we know about all the major concerns that everybody's reporting at the scientific level about uh, potential for uh, massive damage uh, in the future and uh, even in this century. So, but the problem with his solution is that this social planner is dictating an answer, which Nordhaus is calling optimal, based on the social planner's valuation of future people versus current people. It's like kind of a religious exercise where if if the social planner has ethics like this, we get an answer like this. But if he cares less about future generations relative to current generations, we get a different optimal policy. Okay, let me let me interject just for a minute, Larry, because I want everybody who's interested and who's listening to to kind of follow what you're saying. Um, 
So first of all, Nordhaus is working in the uh, very noble tradition of optimal growth theory, intertemporal economic analysis going back to 1950s and 1960s, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And in that framework, the problem is posed as uh, some central decision maker maximizing some criterion which evaluates the consequences of the intertemporal path generated by the actions of the decision maker. So it could be savings and investment and accumulation of capital and expanded net GDP. It could be population that's growing. It could be technology that's changing. And there's some decision arena where the planner or the, I should say, the, the, the yeah, the central planner, the decision maker, um, uh, has uh, discretion. And the question is what to do. One instance of which is a dynamic global model of the evolution of the production of goods and services and also the quality of the climate in which we're living, which is affected by the consequences of producing goods and services. So that's the framework. That's, that's the arena in which the analysis is going forward. Secondly, there are multiple interested parties. In the case at hand, there are people who are alive today, people who were born yesterday, people who are going to be alive in 50 and 100 years, and so on, uh, whose uh, impact upon whom needs to be considered in the context of this optimization problem. And as I understand you, you're asserting, and I, I mean, I think you're just uh, reporting, you're not asserting it, it's true, that uh, one tradition of study of which Nordhaus follows simply posits that you have a relative weight on each of the successive generations that, let's say, diminishes at a constant proportion. So that would be the discount factor. Uh, and you just add them up across all these generations weighted in that way, and you say that's your, your so-called optimal policy. But what you are claiming is that that claim to optimality is a religious not a scientific claim. Uh, yeah, absolutely. This is a tradition that's a bad tradition. Uh, it's not, uh, many economists have been uh, sucked into this uh, thinking that they can posit God and here's God's solution. And what Nordhaus was really saying was uh, my particular God that I'm positing uh, likes future generations relative to current generations in this way. And even if, uh, if it's going to hurt current generations, uh, the policy that he comes up with, that's too bad for them because he's God and he knows what's the right thing to do. Uh, so that there's nothing in Nordhaus's analysis that guarantees that uh, all the generations uh, will be helped from this God's policy. Indeed, we show in our paper that uh, early generations, if we adopt Nordhaus's solution, which well, does yeah. not will be hurt. So you don't get what we economists call Pareto improvement. So there's like these two strands. Nordhaus is more of a macro economist. And you've got this whole long strand of, uh, you know, work in public finance going back to Pagu 100 years ago, uh, a British economist. Yeah. And, uh, these things are not, you know, it's a, at, at odds. What he was doing was is at odds. You know, one way to think about this is if there was actually no carbon problem, there was no... Uh, negative externality uh, okay it wasn't hurting uh the climate whatsoever and nordhaus posits this social planner and this social planner loves future generations a lot well that social planner if he had no other mechanism what he would do is he would tax carbon take the revenues and hand them to people in the future he would invest them and when the f people in the future showed up he would give them the money and this would hurt current generations so okay. uh, so he's no, I understand that there exist social welfare functions, which, if adopted by a social planner, would produce absurd results. I understand that. What I'm, what I'm unclear on is how you avoid the problem of making some non-scientific uh, assumption in order to produce an uh, evaluation of the intertemporal program when you're impacting different generations, some some weight has to be placed on them. No, where did that Where did that come from? Okay, so the the public finance, you know, I'm a public finance economist, and our answer, I'm going to call myself part of my community. Our answer for a century has been, what you do is you think about Pareto improvements. You think about policies 
you think about where the baseline happy welfare of the different generations, current, uh, near term and future generations, where that welfare is going to be. And then you think about a, a policy that's going to make none of those generations worse off and at least some of them better off. And what we've oh, done in the paper. But there are many such policies, right? You know, there's an infinite number. But what we've done in the paper is to choose, find the policy that makes every generation, the current ones, the oldest people right now, the middle aged people right now, the young people right now, those are going to be born in five years or 20 years, and everybody born in the future, we make them all uniformly better off. We, we increase their welfare uh, by the same percentage. Okay, so and, that's the principle of insufficient reason. Given that there's no reason to wait anyone any more, any less than any other, we're going to weight the incremental effect of our policy equally. <coughs> well, we also show, we show results where we uh, take, you know, uh, where we fix this problem, which is basically a missing market. If the old, if the future generations were around, they could, uh, they could pay current generations not to be to uh, be uh, using fossil fuels to the extent that they currently are. So we have a missing market at the bottom of this problem. And the government can come in and try and solve this by saying, look, uh, in a marketplace, you would be facing a price for using fossil fuels that is beyond just the cost of getting the fossil fuels out of the ground. You would uh, have to pay the, co the damage to future generations at the margin. But and so the government in this story is putting on a carbon tax in our model, putting on a carbon tax, but cutting the taxes of the other taxes that current generations are facing, in effect, running a larger deficit and then leaving future generations to pay off that extra debt through higher taxes. OK, so hold, hold, hold on there. before you go on. I just want to get clarity. It seems to me there are two different kinds of economic problems here. One of them has to do with the fact that carbon has effects that are not priced so that the people producing it <clears throat> do not bear the full cost. Right. Another problem is that someone who's going to be born in the year 2025 doesn't get to say anything about a decision that's being made today that affects someone born in the year 2025. Now, how are those two things? <clears throat> because it sounds like you say Nordhaus's uh, theological assumption about the second problem, how to represent the person not yet here, has caused him to miss the solution to the first problem. We're not on the Pareto frontier because we have an unpriced uh, uh, externality. Yeah. There's so explain that. Explain the, the relationship between those two. Well, the way he says <laughs> the problem is he... Um, Excuse me. He has nothing in his mathematics that requires that that every generation be made uh, no worse off. So, you know, mathematically, if I explain it that way, he wrote down something that leads to changes in welfare that can be negative for current generations. Uh, nothing restricts uh, you from getting a, a, the opposite of, you know, hurting certain uh, people to help other people. So he set this up as generational warfare. He set up... Because he described this as a, a, in effect, he set this up as a religious uh, exercise. And, and are you concerned? That, are you concerned that it might therefore impede contemporary political action on behalf of mitigating climate change? Because people are going to take a hit if they follow Nordhaus's policy, which they need not have to take. Right. This. This. Uh, that's exactly what I, what we're saying uh, in effect in this paper, and and I press that point a lot in the Smokin. The view article that's coming out, I point out that uh, if that uh, young gal from Sweden who came to the UN, Greta, I forget her last name, had uh, uh, rather than accusing uh, current generations, current adults of damaging future generations, she had said, look, we realize you guys are selfish. We realize you're burning fossil fuels because you don't get really care about us, but let's make a deal. Let's put on a carbon tax of $70. Let's let that rise 1.5% per year and cut other taxes so that you're ending, you're better off than you are right now under current That's policy. That's uh, Greta, Greta Thunberg, by the way. Thunberg, yeah. If Greta Thunberg has said that, uh, we'll be better off. You'll be better off. Everybody will be better off. Here's the paper that shows it. Uh, and this can be a generational win-win. That's why we call our paper uh, Carbon Taxation as a Generational Win-Win. 
are making carbon taxation a generational win-win. Nordhaus posed the problem in a way to make it a generational win-lose. Let's see, uh, let's, uh, he described it in such a way that everybody came to believe that current generations have to sacrifice to help future generations as opposed to benefiting from uh, getting some of the benefits that future generations would otherwise enjoy. May, may, I, then, may I amend your statement uh, to the effect that what Nordhaus did was pose the problem in such a way that the implication of his solution to the problem was to make current generations worse off? Well, he, he really set it up as a win-lose proposition, as a lose-win, lose for current generations, win for future generations. And then... You mean uh, uniform discounting requires that? I mean, is I just want to make sure I understand the source of this uh, win, uh, win-lose win uh, consequence yeah, he, of Nordhaus's thinking. <coughs> well, he... Um, his solution, uh, which doesn't guarantee, doesn't have any <clears throat> any side payments, any redistribution from future generations to current generations, which would happen under this mechanism I'm talking about, which is cutting the taxes, the non-carbon taxes on current generations, and making future generations pay off that extra debt. That's a mechanism of redistribution. He doesn't have anything like that in his framework, so. He writes, you know, he posits a particular social planner, uh, and then he gets an answer. And then this guy, Nick Stern, not, not Guy, a very famous economist, yeah, of, uh, Sir Nicholas Stern, he was knighted. Sir Nicholas Stern, exactly. Yeah, he was knighted, and, and a very nice guy, and a great guy. And a, uh, so I don't want to just say this guy, he, he's a, a marvelous economist. Yeah. Uh, but, but He was around he, MIT when I was a graduate student. He was coming yeah. over from Nuffield. So Nick was asked to do a major study, I'm not sure who sponsored it, on climate change uh, and uh, the economic carbon tax, you know, what would be optimal carbon taxation. He posits a different social planner with different preferences about the future generations. Uh, Stern's social planner cares more about future generations. Uh, Nordhaus, Nordhaus, Nordhaus's social planner cares less. Nordhaus's social planner has a higher discount rate. He discounts. Discount means make less of. He makes less of the welfare of future generation. Stern's discount, uh, social planners, Stern's God makes more of future generations. And now we have two gods at war. But both are, are saying that we have to damage current generations to help future generations. And the question is, which, how much we sh- sh- do we, is it optimal, quote, optimal, to damage current generations. Okay, it's so not, let me let me ask you this oh, question, Larry. Why is Arrow it? Got into, you know, Arrow got into this too before Ken Arrow, who Nobel Prize winner, the as late well. great Ken Arrow. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me let me ask. Let me ask. My, my professor. So, so why isn't there a separability? I've, I've got the real economy where I've got uh, uh, carbon being produced. I've got goods being produced. I've got environmental consequences of that. I've got a geophysical economic model of the dynamics of that, and that's the real sector. Then I have the financial sector where I've got commitments being made for the government to make transfers. I've got taxes being levied and so forth and so on. Those feel to me like they're different things and like it would be possible to have a path for the real thing and to have compensatory transfers that would distribute the consequences of that across generations in any way that I might like or with a great degree of flexibility. So I don't understand why um, uh, the, even under the Nordhaus or a Stern godlike dispensation, we couldn't append to their uh, uh, eco-climate model a fiscal model that uh, allowed for intergenerational tax equity, you know, borrowing today to be paid back for the future or reducing mm-hmm. consumption today, et cetera. Well, to do the problem right, you don't need a social planner. You don't need to introduce religion. You just leave it out. You just say, look, here's the generations. We're going to introduce a policy that consists of two things. One is time-varying carbon tax rate. So we get at the margin people equating the, the benefits to the costs, including the, 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 the external damage to future generations. And then we're also going to, at the same time, inside the computer program, uh, solve for the transfers that have to be made from future generations to current generations so that everybody's welfare goes up by the same amount. 
So we which is an to- arbitrary criterion, by the way. Yes, but we also in the paper show what would happen if you gave all the benefits to currently living people and gave no benefits to future generations and gave or alternatively gave nothing to current generations and everything to future generations. We need to uh, get everybody on board. The only way I think that's going to happen politically is if nobody gets hurt. Now, well, it may require... Tom, that that's everybody- not true. Pareto improvements are not necessary for a Democratic majority to endorse it. Uh, no, but the way things have been posed have led to, as far as I can see, this non-scientific approach to the economics of climate change have led to Greta Thunberg uh, making it clear that this is you versus us, as opposed to her saying, hey, look, this is a missing market problem. This is an economic inefficiency. It's e- economics 101. All we have to do is fix it. We can all be better off and we can all be better off to the same percentage degree. And we're finding with large damages that we can make with the right carbon tax, which is 70 bucks starting now, growing at one and a half percent. We can make everybody better off by the tune of 5%. So that means that under the no policy scenario, uh, the welfare gain from the right policy, from this uniform welfare improving policy is equivalent to everybody getting to consume 5% more uh, in the world where there's no carbon taxation. Okay, let me, let me ask you this, Larry. In the spirit of Greta, so you've described a world where there's ecology, uh, environment, climate, and where there's economics, but not a world where there's any politics. Let me add politics to your world, politics of the following sort. In order for anything to get done, Some kind of Democratic majority has to endorse it. Most of the voters are over the age of X, X being whatever that number is, 35, 40, 45. Now, they're going to be dead in 50 years. Yeah. And they don't have to care the way that you do and I do about future generations. They might only care about themselves. Uh, As a political matter, Greta could be right that I can never get a majority behind doing what Larry Kotlikoff asked us to do All right, because, no, keep, because keep, there are too many old people who are swaying the elections in favor of their selfish interest. No, economics says the opposite, Glenn. It says there's always a way to uh, that you can absolutely make even the oldest old person better off. And you say, look, we're going to give you some money this year. If you're not paying any taxes, we'll give you some money. We'll make your taxes negative. Or if you are paying taxes, we'll, we'll cut your other taxes. Yes. You will have to pay more when you drive your car, when you get gas at the pump, uh, and when you heat your house. But we're going to cut other taxes or give you money, so you're going to be better off to the same degree that Greta will be better off, to the same degree that everybody in the future will be better off. There are, uh, there are, that's, if I were, for example, running for president, I would be saying, look, we're talking about the climate problem the wrong way. This can be a generational win-win. Uh, if I was Macron and putting on a tax on gas, I would say, look, what we're going to do is put on a tax on gas, but we're also going to cut uh, other taxes so that everybody now alive is going to, on balance, be better off, even though they're going to have to pay higher taxes at the pump. And guess what? We're going to leave that problem, the bill, for future generations to pay, but they're going to be better off on balance because they're going to have a better car, uh, climate. And if had, he, had Macron done that, had Elizabeth Warren proposed that, had uh, you know, a Bernie proposed. If if we start talking about this in an intelligent, scientifically responsible manner, we might actually get a solution. Okay. okay. Do we note it and, uh, and much appreciate? I want to shift the discussion just a little bit, if I can. To what extent do you see? You're an economist. You're a neoliberal economist. I think I can say that. Without, I mean, I think you've already demonstrated that by the very uh, nerdy. Uh, and sort of computationally intensive and, you know, quantitative uh, uh, in, in market uh, uh, field uh, uh, approach that you've taken to this problem. And I'm for it. I'm for it. That's, I'm with you 100%. Right. Um, but uh, not everybody's a neoliberal economist. Some people hate capitalism. They hate industrial civilization. Uh, they think that uh, as a religious matter, you were talking about religion, they think as a religious matter that uh, profit 
and they drive for profit. Oil companies, the Koch brothers, the Saudis, um, are destroying the planet. Okay, they want to shut things down. They don't want high levels of economic growth. They want lower levels. Of they don't want megalopolis cities with 20 million people of them springing up in China. They want less than that. They don't like international commerce. Okay, I mean, these are people who are out there. Okay? okay, I don't know if Greta is one of them. I don't attribute that to her, but she could be. Okay, so they're not going to be persuaded. I'm, what I'm saying is, <laughs> I'm saying that, notwithstanding the fact that you've uh, you know broadened the, uh, the the sort of foundation of welfare uh, calculation for intergenerational and whatever, the people who are for the Green New Deal, some of them, many of them, are not going to. They're not going to be moved by that analysis. I'm asking you what you think about that. Am I wrong? Well, there are some people that wouldn't be, uh, let me put it this way, uh, would um, uh, the folks that push for the Green New Deal prefer to have a $70 carbon tax growing at 1.5%, making everybody, according to our calculations, 5% better off relative to the status quo? I think they would love that. And by the way, the solution in our model has carb as has coal production shut down forever, starting immediately. So that's what the so their proposal, the Green New Deal, a part of it calls for the end of fossil fuel production. Well, we don't get that. We get the end of coal immediately. We get the use of reliance on oil and gas for quite a while. But fossil fuels are produced. Um, out through the next 75 years rather than the next 125 years. So fossil fuels come to an end in terms of their uh, production in uh, 50 years earlier under this optimal carbon tax. So uh, I don't know whether uh, the people that, um, if we got that passed through Congress, whether other people, whether people who are pushing the new green deal would be thoroughly happy or completely happy, but it would, uh, that's not, an economic question. Okay, I'm not sure I can. Uh, if if they're talking about can we engage in policies that um, make me happy and make uh, I'd like to take money from the Koch brothers and give it to myself or give it to everybody in the world, uh, that's not a, a, a question that economists can answer. Maybe a yeah. priest, maybe maybe a priest uh, or some of these religious economists can answer it, but not a real economist. Okay, let me let me try to push it another direction. Then, you say there's a religious element to the way that certain uh, economists, William Norhouse amongst them, very much deserving of his Nobel Prize, but uh, have approached the the problem of evaluating the welfare of, uh, of different generations in the climate context. That's religion of a small R kind to me, relative to the religion with a big R that I see animating some of the activists. Uh, on the uh, uh, alarmist uh, climate change uh, uh, kind of uh, barricades. Uh, the uh, the uh, science of climate change isn't, is it? I'm asking, I'm asking what you think. Uh, as um, uh, absolutely bleak, I mean, uh, the world is coming to an end, the sky is falling, uh, or maybe maybe another way that I want to put it is, aren't there uh, judgments that have to be made about the cause and effect, you say uh, carbon uh, use stopping in 50 years rather than 75 or something like that, about the cause and effect consequences of uh, of carbon emission, uh, aren't there, which have big standard errors on them, where it's not exactly clear what technological change is going to be, what thermal uh, geothermal activity is going to be, what uh, solar radiation is going to be, what, what uh, you know, et cetera. And, yeah. and, and it's possible to take the, the highball estimates of those, uh, the most oblique uh, scenarios, the one that drives policy. Yeah, well, what we do in this paper is uh, use a, a damage, uh, we use Nordhaus's assumptions to the maximum extent possible, and we assume... Uh, in the result I was talking about, which is a $70 carbon tax growing at one and a half percent, we assume uh, damages that are much higher than Nordhaus. We use the same mathematical function, but we tweak it <clears throat> to make the damages uh, much higher, close to what people really uh, 
have said might be the maximum damages uh, over the next 200 years. So we are kind of, uh, and you could look at any um, assumptions about damages. Uh, we don't know for sure. And you could also take our model and what, which is what we're now working on and in- introduce uncertainty about what the damages will be and what the relationship between carbon and, and temperature will be and how much productivity growth there will be in solar and other uh, clean energies. So that's all part of our research agenda. But in the end, you still want to answer the question from a scientific perspective, uh, by how, how, how can we, um, by how much should we put a, uh, set, what level should we set a carbon tax and what redistribution policy should we use so that every generation in the context of uncertainty experiences the same uh, increase in what what's called what you and I would call average uh, or expected utility over their lifetime. So we would there's a way there's an analogous way to deal with uncertainty from the scientific uh, side, and that refers to uh, looking at what's called expected utility. Not for sure, I'm going to for sure generate a five percent welfare gain for generations born 50 years from now. I'm going to produce uh, under this, under a policy, an average gain of, let's say, 5%. So what I'm saying is that the modeling has to go from what we've done now to incorporating uncertainty about uh, some of these relationships between carbon and and damages. Uh, And then also... So you've bracketed the the climate science debate. Uh, you're, you're taking as given some baseline estimates and then you're tweaking that by line for the possibility that it could be epsilon above or below. Yeah, but we're going beyond, you know, the first paper to also incorporate, uh, probability distributions of, of, uh, damages and of relationships that are in the model, the supply side of the model, making the supply side uncertain because we don't know for sure what these relationships are. So we have to, incorporate the uncertainty to do a, a better scientific job. Tell me and about your to... co-authors. Uh, excuse me. Um, we kind of get into the end, I think. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who's a very well-known economist at Columbia, the Earth Institute. Uh, who is the uh, Swiss guy and who is the uh, Russian well, guy? Well, the Russian guy is at the Guidar Institute. I've been associated with, with them for uh, about six years or so, working on different uh, public finance problems with uh, a group of economists there. And he's, uh, his name is Andre Polbin, fantastic uh, person, fantastic economist. So it's great to have an international collaboration on this project. I've presented this paper to the EPA. I just presented it uh, at Oxford. Uh, I presented it at the Econometrica Society meetings. Uh, Everybody who's seen this immediately says, oh, this is the right way to think about it because it's, it's obvious this is a public finance to so a public finance economist. It's quite obvious. And the interesting intellectual uh, backstory here, Glenn, is that at the same time that Bill Nordhaus was kind of working on these problems in the late seventies and early eighties uh, to start, you know, when he's starting out, I was sitting uh, one building, a, uh, well, starting in 1980, I was one building apart from him doing the kind of uh, generational computer modeling uh, that underlies the calculations that we made in this, you know, that's in this paper uh, that finds this uniform welfare improving carbon tax policy. And, uh, you know, I actually even presented a seminar uh, at the Coles Foundation. Nordhaus was there. And uh, at the seminar, James Tobin, who got the Nobel Prize, uh, immediately said, "You, this, what you're doing is wrong. You can't, you can't solve this problem." And he was insistent for the next 20 minutes that it was wrong. And then Nordhaus piped up and he said, "Jim, no, you've got it. You've got it wrong. Larry's wrong for a different reason." And then we had, and then Bill Brainerd said, "You know, uh, you guys, uh, you're both wrong because Larry's wrong for this third reason that you guys don't get." And anyway. In the end, Tobin agreed that it w- that what I was doing was right, and the book uh, uh, a lot of papers were published. This was work I did with Alan Auerbach. Uh, we wrote a book called. Let, let, let me just interject, baby, uh, uh, Larry, because I don't think people understand James, the legendary James Tobin, a towering figure in the 
uh, American economic establishment, a Keynesian uh, monetary economist and macroeconomist of the Milton Friedman and Paul Samuelson uh, stature. Uh, William Brainerd, uh, not quite as great an economist, but nevertheless a very substantial uh, was he ever a fellow of the American Economics Association, a distinguished fellow? I think he might have been, and, uh, and of course, Nordhaus. So you were there. What were you, an assistant professor at Yale at the time, Larry? Uh, they hired me as an associate professor. I thought they hired me for this work, but I guess some people hired, liked the work and maybe other people didn't. I got they, to the, they both thought it was wrong, but they thought it was wrong for different reasons. Three, three people thought it was wrong for uh, three different reasons, uh, and they were sure the other two were wrong about their reasons. and. The, you know, and then I go go off. Nordhaus continues. So we had solved basically the me, the, the machinery to solve that problem the right way. We Alan Auerbach and I had figured out by 1981, and we have a paper. You know, 1981, 1982, we have a paper published in uh, International Economic Review that does this sharing across generations that fixes uh, uh, inefficiencies and looks at the efficiency gains, the pure efficiency gains from uh, fixing um, market problems. And so that system, that mecha- the machinery was sitting there a block away from where he was, his office was, uh, and we never connected, probably because I was, I, I was so shocked that these people were so opposed to what I was doing and didn't really have a, a clear explanation of why. And then finally, you know, I kept writing... Notes to Tobin, uh, you know, here's how to see how this works. And then he, I went into his office a couple months later, and I'm a young guy. And I, he says to me, you don't have to worry about this. You don't have to. Uh, why are you s- still concerned about this? Well, I said, well, look, if I'm wrong, I need to know it. And if you're wrong, I'd like you to know it. <laughs> and anyway, the problem started in September. By December, he finally sends me a note saying he agreed it was correct. So, okay, progress. I think that's a, a good note on which to end the late great James Tobin agreeing that you were right and he was wrong. <laughs> well, I'm not. Uh, not what do you make of the most recent Nobel Prize uh, to the flow and uh, Banerjee? Well, I think uh, they're very well deserved. I think the idea of getting economics uh, to be of practical assistance in the world is critical because we economists can't just sit in our ivory tower. So the work on this climate, you know, is is an example of economics coming to the rescue. They're going to places or poor places around the world and trying experiments that will actually, you know, give people incentives to do to, let's say, feed their children or educate their children uh, or whatever it is that they're um, uh, that uh, will help uh, society there with. Uh, uh, so so experimenting over social policy, I think that's really, really good and important. I think this is really the future of economics, which is making it practically useful. And what the committee did here was award that. Uh, trend of economics. You also saw that in the in the prize this last year to Richard Thaler, who got the yeah, prize for a couple of years. Okay, yeah, but I would have thought, Larry, that you might have had some misgivings uh, about the uh, random uh, uh, controlled trial uh, based uh, award uh, to uh, Banerjee and Duflo. The misgivings having been, you're a modeler. I mean, you just spent an hour regaling us with all of the uh, uh, computable general equilibrium down in the weeds, uh, science, which is about calibrating the system. It's about attempting to approximate the interactive system. Whereas Mm -hmm. this RTC stuff is all about small scale, partial equilibrium measurement of interventions without any real effort to comprehend how the things are related across one another in some complex way. And I should have thought that uh, that might have uh, given you some pause. Well, you know, I, I it was another, uh, you know, methodologically. Yeah. yeah, it's not my method. It's not the it's not the way I would do economics. It's not my focus. And if I were forced to do work on that problem, I might do it the way they did it. Uh, I just don't know enough about uh, the problem and exactly how they handled it. I would have liked to have seen Jeff Sachs win the 
uh, get the award as well because uh, you can only give it to three people apparently. But if um, he was really the first person, first economist to say, look, we have to actually go to the uh, get onto the ground of the developing world and really make a difference. We in academia, because of course the World Bank and the IMF have been yeah. going for years with economists. But Jeff made a big effort with the Millennial Project to, uh, and, and these three people actually turned out to be his students, each one of them. So I told him that he got the award through his students and that that was actually a better outcome than uh, his getting it himself. Energy had been a student of Sachs? According to Jeff. So. Yeah. Well, he, he, it's what he wrote me. Maybe. Oh, you mean he as an undergraduate at Harvard? Because Banerjee's Princeton, isn't he? He's at Princeton, but maybe he was at Harvard as an undergrad, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I don't you I know. I know Sachs directed the uh, Harvard Institute for International Development for years there. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I nominated uh, um, Harberger uh, for the Nobel Prize. Uh, Good I, public I, finance, man. Arnold Harberger's. Uh, yeah. He's older, but, you know, what what he did in public. I mean, even finance, now, he's still living? As far as I know, yeah. He's still at UCLA, emeritus professor, and um, I think he's in good shape. Uh, as far, I hope so. But he I made so enormous too. contributions uh, to economics. Marty Feldstein, uh, God bless him, but he passed away uh, this yeah. year. He, he could have gotten the Nobel Prize for work in public finance uh, yeah. and also social insurance. So there are a lot of people. It's hard. You know, we don't have the James, the towering figures, the James Tobins, the Robert Solos, the Paul Samuelsons, the Ken Arrows to give the prize to. We do have one towering figure left, I would say. That's Glenn Lowry. So I <laughs> want to push on you. <laughs> and, uh, Did you guys I, hear that? He said it. I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think uh, I think you should get the prize, and I, I hope it comes Thank soon. Thank you. Uh, I hope you don't curse me by saying so. Okay, uh, thanks, Larry, for giving us your time. The Glenn Show. Uh, we we've talked economics. It's been fun. Uh, I learned something. Thanks a lot. Hey, my pleasure. We'll talk. Yeah.